Welcome, data lovers. Uh, our next speaker on the AI track is uh, Ivan Gligorievich, uh, who is uh, the CEO at M-Brain Train uh, company. Uh, decoding uh, brain patterns using AI, how far can we reach? This is the next uh, speech. So uh, electroencephalography is an unobtrusive method of uh, obtaining information on the brain's processes. So reading human brain data in the moment of events allows us to obtain objective truth about our perception and exclude known human biases inherent to memory recall. But uh, observing brain activity is itself not enough without the means to decode it. AI is showing promises on decoding mental processes with more robust, but sometimes ambiguous new features. So even the, Igor, the floor is yours. Welcome. Welcome everyone. I'm going to talk about decoding brain patterns using AI and how far it can get us. My name is Ivan. I'm working at Membrane Train. We are a company that makes mobile brain wave readers for scientific purposes. Uh, how do we read brain at all? Uh, let me spend a few moments to explain. Uh, there are three most common and frequently used techniques. Uh, one is functional magnetic resonance. So uh, when your brain is active in a certain area, uh, there is more oxygen in that area. Uh, fMRI uses this principle to see when and what brain area is active and uh, co make conclusions out of that. However, it's very uh, cumbersome. It has a good uh, so-called spatial resolution. So to pinpoint what part of your brain is active, but very low temporal resolution, like uh, how that changes in time. The second way uh, to address, uh, to assess brain activity is using uh, MEG or magnetoencephalography. So basically these big machines uh, measure magnetic fields uh, of uh, your uh, neuro uh, neocortex, the youngest part of uh, our evolutionary brains, but also the most advanced. Uh, however, uh, this machine uh, provides uh, a smaller spatial uh, resolution than fMRI, meaning it cannot see what happens deep in your brain but it can uh, very well track things in time. Uh, so it changes uh, uh, on a scale much closer to, uh, to let's uh, call it real time of the brain. Finally, there is electroencephalography or EEG. Uh, this is what we do. This is what we find also most interesting. Uh, very similarly to MEG, uh, the electrodes that you see on this guy's head uh, measure the uh, uh, potentials uh, that are uh, coming from underlying uh, neural activity. So they're basically measuring uh, uh, electric fields uh, that uh, change the, due to the changes of uh, underlying neurons. And uh, all three methods, of course, have their pros and cons. What sets apart uh, the EEG is great combination of uh, availability uh, and mobility from uh, recently. Uh, and the ease of use, so that uh, makes it uh, uh, that makes it uh, very attractive. Our team is working to utilize this mix. Uh, we developed fully mobile EEG systems, uh, and uh, the idea here is to enable some very very complex uh, experiments to be done as simple as possible. So uh, this is a huge challenge. Uh, why do we want to do that? Well, uh, traditionally, you make uh, brainwave, let's call them experiments in laboratories, but uh, there is a lot of things that you cannot translate to, to uh, labs, uh, how our brain works in uh, everyday settings, uh, in normal environments, in uh, so-called real-life environments. And that is where uh, mobile EEG systems uh, can help. Now, that prompted us to develop our most popular product, Smarting. Uh, it is now used in over 40 countries in many, many places. I just named a few universities uh, that, uh, that are well known who are our users. And this is how the system looks like. So basically, you have these electrodes that uh, measure 
uh, underlying uh, potentials. Uh, the box in the back of the head is uh, conducting uh, sampling of, of these recordings, uh, digital conversion, and uh, streaming via Bluetooth to either mobile phone, uh, like in this picture, or a computer, uh, where a mobile phone can be a recording unit, or more than that, it can also be used uh, to provide certain feedback uh depending on a, on a paradigm that is uh, that is investigated but the point is that this way we really can see how our brain uh behaves in in everyday situations i want to give you a, a glimpse on what we are recording and how does it look like and is there something to see out of that so uh, in the bottom uh, left part you see the so-called time series so uh, vertical axis actually corresponds to channels. Uh, channel is each uh, recording spot on the brain. So one recording spot will result uh, uh, in one row of this recording. So the bottom axis is time. Uh, one simple example uh, that this picture is showing is uh, in the left part, you will see that there is some kind of oscillatory activity. Uh, so that happens when you close your eyes uh, and observe in places at the back of your head, this so-called occipital domain, and you will uh, see the increase of alpha band power. So for the, for the time being, you can just take my word that uh, entire frequency content uh, of, uh, of these recordings can be divided in certain spectral bands. Uh, the spectral band where we are observing this is called alpha, and you are in the uh, top right corner, you can see a peak in this alpha uh, spectral band when we close our eyes with respect to uh, uh, the rest of the, of the data and this uh, left part where we don't observe that thing. Uh, now, of course, this is a very basic example, just showing, um, uh, showing how can we move from uh, time domain to spectral domain. Uh, but uh, the same principle is uh, used for a more complex uh, analysis of EEG data. So we combine what happens in time, uh, let's say for one uh, glasses looking at the uh, time domain and uh, spectral domain looking through, let's say, other uh, parts of the glasses. And that is how uh, EEG research uh, has been going on for uh, decades now. But retra uh, retracting a uh, step back uh, and asking the question, why would anyone uh, be interested in uh, how a healthy day works, uh, how healthy brain uh, works during a regular day? Well, uh, I was myself very surprised to find out around 12 years ago that uh, it, it is incredibly little uh, that we know about our brain and and how it works. Uh, one reason for that is that uh, there is no complete theory that explains uh, how our brain functions. I believe that you know that. Uh, but uh, certainly a big contributing factor is that not many human brains are recorded uh, when they're healthy. Uh, usually our brain recordings are related to uh, medical applications and that is uh, actually not helping a lot to find out on, on, on uh, everyday brain functioning. Uh, if we did know how our brain functions every day, let me share a bit of the vision. Uh, this could make uh, our life better in, in, in many ways. Uh, you, of course, naturally come, it comes uh, into mind that uh, we could be healthier in the medical uh, sense that we could detect um, uh, some neurological disorders uh, sooner, that we could also actually develop a way to, ways to extract uh, uh, biomarkers that would precede the certain neurological uh, conditions if we had uh, sufficiently many recordings of healthy brains, actually normal brains, some of which would certainly develop these uh, conditions. And uh, this would allow us to uh, timely detect wh when it, this is going to happen and maybe prevent it. But uh, we don't stop here. Uh, we could also get rid of the stress, uh, increase productivity, 
or solves uh, sleep problems. Um, how basically when we observe the brain, uh, we could see how it behaves in relations to in relation to outside uh, factors, and we could tweak those factors to help our brain, which is us, achieve what we want to achieve. Um, one visionary way to uh, also affect the brain is also to use the, the, the music to steer uh, uh, the brain activity and use our brain to steer music and, and, and create a closed loop there that would help us also uh, live more uh, fulfilling life and, and uh, get uh, better at work or uh, relaxing. Uh, another thing that we could do is use uh, brain activity to uh, conduct after stroke uh, rehabilitation. There are many groups doing that. Uh, it's so, uh, it's um, so-called EG neurofeedback. Uh, and I, I believe that this, uh, this domain is also going to progress in the years to come. Uh, it may seem like a buzzword, but um, our unconscious uh, is actually controlling our lives. And um, if we could, you know, make this tangible and quantifiable, uh, that would uh, greatly assist us in uh, understanding uh, what do we do and effects on some things uh, on our lives. Uh, one a very simple example that I read in, in a book, we tend, our uh, brains uh, tend to be biased uh, in, a, in either positive or, or negative way. For instance, when we remember uh, the, our favorite holiday, uh, we will remember that uh, uh, every moment of it was perfect, uh, all the friends, uh, every sentence, every uh, date, every, and every night out. But this is uh, actually uh, how it looks like in hindsight and in reality it wasn't like that so uh, our brain is uh, is biasing us and we cannot control it and the only way to uh, objectively know uh, and measure uh, to know what effect uh, 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 we had or if something had on us is to uh, quantify it at the moment of happening this is the only way to, to know the truth but possibilities are, are basically uh, endless and there are many domains uh, where uh, it has applications. We believe uh, at MBT that these uh, visions can become reality if we manage to make an interface uh, based on mental states. Uh, that's uh, as simple as it sounds, I actually sounds simple, but we have to have two conditions fulfilled in order for this to become real. Uh, one is to be able to record brain activity in real time with high quality equipment. And the other is to uh, be able to process the large amounts of collected data and discover uh, the relevant brain patterns, which is where actually AI comes into play. Uh, how AI can help us decode brain activity, I mentioned on the slide where I had the EEG example. Uh, uh, switching from time domain to frequency domain. Now, uh, traditionally, uh, we use this, uh, this combination of time and frequency domain to kind of guess formulas, transformations that would uh, help us extract relevant features that would, for instance, quantify how tired we are or how engaged we are uh, in, in some activity. Uh, but this is not optimal. Uh, because uh, of the incomplete underlying theory of how the brain works. And uh, AI is maybe not going to help us immediately uh, get to this underlying theory, but it may help us and it is helping us actually uh, get better features uh, that are more accurate and uh, more useful. Just to name a few applications, I mentioned estimating mental workload, detecting attention, predicting uh, seizures, uh, epileptic seizures, uh, discovering sleep patterns, and in general decoding many sensory responses, uh, uh, among other uh, among other things. Uh, I'm going to use one example to to talk about uh, about AI in EEG, but this example actually extends to uh, all of the domains I mentioned and uh, and more. Um, this uh, example I'm going to comment is so-called online auditory attention detection. Simply speaking, uh, 
let's say that you are trying to listen to one of the two speakers, two persons that are talking at the same time, at the same time and you're trying to focus on one of them. Uh, uh, long story short, uh, it has been proven that our brain actually uh, helps us do that by uh, by diminishing the uh, the input from uh, the uh, unattentive uh, speaker uh, that uh, that you don't want to listen to. So, but what your brain does is not as simple. If you want to uh, to do it on a machine level, and there are people, for instance, that uh, have this need. People uh, with a hearing impairment, uh, they have a device uh, uh, connected their, directly to their uh, auditory nerve. And uh, this device actually should help them hear uh, what is in their surroundings. Uh, but this device cannot uh, do what a healthy brain does, and at least not yet. So diminish the speaker that we don't want to listen to. Uh, what we tried, uh, and uh, did was uh, transform uh, the mobile EEG of a, a healthy listener uh, uh, using a decoder, which is uh, just a uh, machine learning uh, driven uh, linear regressor to reconstruct an envelope uh, of, uh, of, this, uh, of the brain waves that the person uh, who listened actually had and to correlate this envelope with uh, uh, one in the second uh, speech envelope of those speakers. The higher correlation uh, actually points to uh, that speaker being the target of, uh, of, our, of our listener. And uh, with, the, with this uh, uh, correlation, uh, you see that these numbers are very low. So you can uh, hope maybe theoretically to reach 0.2 correlation, but not, not more than that. Uh, you guess, uh, who who was the uh, the speaker that our listener wanted to listen to? Uh, the precision of this method is around sixty three or sixty five percent. So in in uh, let's say uh, it's of course uh, higher uh, high above the, the 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 chance level, but it's still uh, relatively low, uh, but useful of course. Uh, this is uh, just a um, relevance matrix. So of all the recorded uh, channels, we, uh, we actually see that the most relevant are uh, those that are in, uh, in auditory, uh, near the audit auditory cortex, which is, which is normal and logical. And this is uh, the picture from the, from the paper I quote in the bottom right section. The other approach that we have delved in uh, uh, when solving this task uh, is a classification approach. Uh, here we actually uh, use machine learning in a classification task by putting the multi-channel EEG uh, amended by uh, audio envelope uh, to a convolutional uh, net uh, neural network consisting of three convolutional layers and uh, plus four fully connected layers. Uh, we train this network, and uh, it gives us a similarity score, uh, which basically tells us uh, tells us that, uh, is that the list uh, the speaker that uh, our listener uh, wanted to hear or not. Uh, it is also uh, described in the in this uh, publication below. Uh, we uh, we did ourselves the, the, this this work, uh, uh, and uh, uh, this is basically. The most important uh, thing that I wanted to share, uh, the results uh, are uh, way better than uh, in the first approach. Uh, so uh, here you have uh, three graphs with the 10, uh, the two or 0.5 second input data. We used 50 epochs and uh, the accuracy is uh, over 90%. And even in this uh, 0.5 seconds, the, the accuracy is around 85%. And no, the network was not overtrained, just to answer some of your questions. Uh, but uh, the important notion here is that uh, with this precision on, on such a small, uh, uh, with, uh, with such small uh, chunks of time, uh, you, you see that uh, this technique could be used for uh, real time uh, recordings. And that's going to uh, give you a glimpse of the next step, and that is, can we reconstruct the speech just from the recorded EEG? Uh, 
the network uh, you see here, actually the layout, you have multi-channel EEG as an input uh, to an encoder network. You get the embedded information from EEG, uh, put it into a decoder network, have a, a spectrogram of speech reconstructed. And then with a vocoder network, you go to reconstructed speech. Uh, I'm just going to play you a small, uh, small part that, that we managed to reconstruct. So the original speech in German, Reconstructed speech. Once again. And reconstructed. I hope you could you could hear that. This is very impressive uh, for me, only if only being the first step. What is important out of all the applications that I mentioned, very similarly, we could use these encoder networks to get the relevant features for any of these specific domains, like workload, uh, like attention and, uh, and others. So this is a very promising thing. So uh, just to end with a key, uh, few key outtakes, uh, our lives can be significantly better with uh, EEG. We can achieve our goals easier. Hardware is going to become better and compa consumer compatible soon. Uh, there is a huge AI role in this. We have made the first steps in this direction. And uh, there is, of course, an open question of uh, proper approach and network structure. I will not be answering questions on that for the moment, but I promise to inform you uh, when we make uh, more progress in that domain. Stay tuned, and especially in the next five years, I believe that this technology is going to become mainstream. So let's see what the future uh, holds. Thank you.